All right. Well, everybody, welcome to the November edition of the American Praetorians live stream. Or if anybody's got any other ideas of what to call this thing, let me know. So we've got uh, Alex Aronson with us tonight, uh, co-author with James Rousseau on the Monroe Doctrine, a couple of volumes of the Monroe Doctrine ser series, and author of the new Soviet Endgame series, which first book just came out uh, two weeks ago. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, it's been it's been two weeks. Two weeks yesterday. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself, Alex, and All right. give us a little bit of a rundown? Well, first, I just want to say thanks for having me on, Pete. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I know we got a a pretty tight community of military fiction and military thriller authors. Um, and so I've, I've just really been enjoying being a part of that group. Um, as far as, as my story, uh, I was a, uh, I was a, a Russian linguist in the Navy uh, back in the sweet spot, right when there was literally nothing to do. Um, basically the, the way this worked out was uh, when I, when I joined the Navy, uh, there was this place called the Soviet Union. Um, but by the time I, got to training, they quit. And so job well done, that, right? What's that? Yeah. Job well done. They knew you were yeah, coming. Yeah, exactly. They heard I was coming and they said, no, nah, no, nah, we're out. And, you know, I know Reagan takes all my credit, but, you know, it's okay. You know, I think it's important that we- They were there for reach. years before they collapsed. That's right. So, so yeah, I, I, I really, like I said, I really threaded the needle because the, the Cold War was really ending and there was literally nothing for us to do. Uh, we we heard all the old salts come in and tell us about how great it was back in the day when the when the Russians would come out and play, but you know we didn't see any of that. Um, and then I got out in in '97. That was when I when I got out of uh, active duty, went over to the reserves and drilled over there for three years. Um, you know, do the math. I got out basically right before September 11th, and so um, you know there was there was a there was definitely a part of me that wanted that thought about going back in, but I was just starting law school at the time. And, uh, you know, one thing, you know, one thing leads to another, you know, it started a family. Um, and so, so yeah, I just, I have this really weird spot where, where it's like, you know, on, on veterans day, uh, you know, two weeks ago, uh, you know, it was, thank you for your service. I'm like, guys, you don't even know, man, my service was such a cakewalk. Um, so yeah, don't, don't give me the free meal. I, I don't, I don't feel like I rate it. So, uh, but but the whole time that I was in, and you know when I when I, I went to college after uh, after the Navy, and I always wanted to to write. I always had these story ideas, and I really thought, okay, I can I can put this together. I can make this work, and it never happened. I, I have you know probably most most writers start out with something like a you know fifty unfinished drafts of, of various uh, degrees of completeness, but. There was just something about three years ago where I said, OK, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to write a novel because I, I know I'm never going to finish that. But what I am going to do is I'm going to write a short story. And I was watching YouTube and I, I am an absolute policy nerd. Uh, my my uh, degree is in international relations. And then I got my my Juris Doctor. Um, so I was watching videos on YouTube, as you do. And in this case, it was Jimmy Carter was talking about what he would have done differently during the Iran hostage crisis. and what he said was, I would have sent another helicopter. And, and that was just a reference to they, they dropped under the minimum threshold of, uh, of the uh, sea stallions that they needed to complete the operation. So they, so they decided to, to give up. And so he was just saying, well, we would have just sent an extra helicopter and everything would have turned out right. And and I didn't believe that for a minute. Because there was only one thing that went wrong with that. Operation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. In yeah. fact, um, there was a uh, there was a book that I read called uh, I think it was Broken Stiletto that did a really good history on it and one of the people interviewed in that basically said look when they when they called the operation and they canceled it uh, they were just looking for a reason at that point and that helicopter just happened to be the reason um, you know that finally got them to to where they were trying to go uh, and and it's it's such a it's such a convoluted uh, operation that they put together. Uh, I didn't think that was going to be the case, but but what I did think was that well, it sure would be fun to write the story of the you know of that eagle claw going differently. Um, I'll give you guys a mild spoiler for the book, but it really it's something that really kind of fascinates me. Uh, eagle claw is considered a success in in the book, 
but they lose 13 hostages. Okay. Oh, so, so it's a Russian success. <laughs> right. Right. It's right. So to be a hostage. What's that? There, there's an old saying, sucks to be a hostage. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. So. Well, you weren't going to get yourself out of there. So. Well. So in our timeline, it's a total failure, but we get all the hostages back. And, and in the book, it's a success, but we, they lose th you know, 13 of them. So, um, but yeah, that, so I decided I was going to write that as a short story. And, and I did, I wrote it, it had a beginning, a middle and an end. I was very happy with it, but I thought, well, okay, well, well, we can, we can probably pick this up and, and run with it. And so what I actually did for the next thing was I did kind of the same exercise, only I wrote up the, uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 79. And so I, again, I had a short story that had a beginning and a middle and an end. And I was like, Oh, well, that's kind of neat too. And, and they take place in kind of the same time frame. And, and so, you know, over time, I just kind of got the idea to maybe do something else with it. And, and that's when I, uh, I reached out to, uh, to James Rizone. I'd been reading his uh, red storm series, which I, I thought was great. And I just said, Hey, do you got any advice, uh, for, for, you know, what I should do with this. I've got, you know, I've got 50,000 words down, you know, it's not a, it's not a cohesive story, but it's, it's a start of something. Uh, and, and he basically said, okay, well, hold on. I've got, I've got a bunch of other irons in the fire right now, but, but we'll definitely work on something. Uh, and, and that's when he, uh, he did approach me about working on uh, Monroe Doctrine. And, and that was great. That was, that was fantastic because it was already a book series that had been going um, he was actually going to work with it, uh, work on it with another uh, author who unfortunately got got activated and sent overseas. And so basically, a, you know, a billet came up and I got to fill it. And and what I what I really liked about that storyline was that I was able to to not have to worry about the overarching plot and I could just focus on writing characters. And, and, you know, my, my philosophy at the time was that, that plot only exists so that my characters have something to talk about. And, and it was, uh, it was, it, that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, because it just really, it was kind of like, almost like stress free, stress free writing because I didn't have to tie everything off. I didn't have to, you know, do a lot of the, a lot of the maintenance work of, of writing. So, so, so yeah, then once we, once we finished that, we got together last uh, December and said, okay, what's next? And I said, well, you know, I've been trying to do this, this alternate history thing. Um, so maybe let's take a crack at that. And, and, you know, James agreed. And so, yeah, we, we, we got really fortunate. First book uh, came out two weeks ago and the, the second volume, it just went to the editor today. So, so nice. really excited about that. It's supposed to drop in January. All right. All right. It, it's funny you mentioned the uh, that the plot only exists to give your characters something to talk about, because especially in like the techno thriller or military science fiction uh, genre, a lot of a lot of authors go at it the exact opposite way, where the characters just exist to move the plot forward, and the plot is the main uh, attraction to the right. the book or, or story. And I, I really think it's a balancing act. And so that's why I was saying that for me, writing characters is something that I really enjoy. I really like trying to make, you know, characters that are believable, that are real, that have conversations like you would have with Pete or, you know, conversations that I would have with, with <laughs> People can't you read that. Want, well, that actually, actually, that is the funniest part uh, to me is that there's, there's a character in uh, Advanced to Contact uh, who, who gets a nickname uh, and there's no explanation for where the nickname came from. Um, and that's because I, I actually had to delete that whole scene because it was it was that inappropriate. Um, and the worst part was that that was totally 100 percent based on a real thing that really happened. Yeah. Wait, are, you're uh, telling uh, me that military nicknames and call signs come from inappropriate conversations and situations? I'm not saying that Coop and I know multiple people like that, but I'm not, not saying it either. Hey, I mean, listen, you know, mouthwash had it coming. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of interesting, the, that character versus plot thing. I don't know. It's, it's not something I tend to get that. I don't want to use the term wrapped around the axle about it's 
I kind of, I've kind of been trying to do both, I think, from the beginning. Um, I've gotten better at the characterization as time has gone on. Um, and some of that, I think, came from largely the, the series that I just uh, put one out, the number 12 of out today, uh, Brannigan's Blackhearts, because I had... I had initially intended the series to be a more of a standalone. So I had to kind of be able to introduce each character at the beginning of the story. Right. Now you failed that approach hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's a standalone a dozen books later. Yeah, the, the sequel's coming out next month. So. Well, I didn't necessarily, uh, not necessarily standalone like that, but you could pick up any of the series. They're episodic. Point basically. In the right. series yeah. without being lost. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's something that I've really found a bit challenging um, with with series writing is I am more used to having I pick up a book and, and you kind of like I was saying with the short story, you know where the beginning is, the middle and the end. And you can walk away from that book and and, and be done with it. Um, but instead, you know, when you're when you're writing a series and you know how many books you have. You're like, okay, well, no, there's there's definitely got to be a cliffhanger at the end of this one, and there's got to be a redemption at the end of this one, and 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 moving through it like that, um, it's 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 been really really eye opening. Uh, like seeing e how that each works. book has to act as its own contained story and as an act for a non traditional act structure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I've done a couple where I've ended it with a, a cliffhanger. But generally, I try to have a fairly, I might have the door open for the next book, but I try to have a fairly solid ending. Yeah. Uh, just in case the next book doesn't happen. That's right. You never know. <laughs> yeah, that's why, you know, in this case, you know, we planned it out as a, as essentially a five book, you know, arc. And so I at least know where I can finally, you know, get that conclusion, um, you know, and, and God willing, I don't win the lottery and walk away from all this, you know, four books in, but. Uh, That's right. I, don't know. I think it's it's fire, the five story arc. It's supposed to be seven, but. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I might feel obligated to finish it, even if I did win the lottery. And oh, absolutely! I just, I just don't like the if I get hit by a bus part of that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's that that's definitely a bit of a downer. But I mean, it, it tends to be the the kind of thing that us infantry guys tend to default to anyway. Right. But uh, that's why you pick out a ghostwriter and have your notes <laughs> set ready to go. That's right. That assumes that I've got all the notes set ahead of each installment which i have not really been doing that much of but uh the 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 having the set number of books is something i'm still working on uh, I'm, right i'm getting i'm getting better at it but yeah uh, yeah wasn't the law supposed to be like a, a trilogy at first no well it was let's put three out first and see what's gonna see how it does. And then Ice and Monsters did well, so I started thinking huge, like Galaxy's Edge huge. It's the it was the chem lights on the cover, man. That's what did it. That's what sold the books. <laughs> but uh but yeah, as <clears throat> as I get more into the business side of this this business, it's Wrapping it up around five or six and then starting something new seems to be the way to go. Yeah. But at the same time, I was actually seeing some comments uh, earlier today that to the effect that some people don't even want to start unless they see that there's at least three books. Yeah. So. Well, and I think once you get past once you get past five, then I really feel like you're going to start dealing with some reader fatigue. Um where people are like, you know, hurry up, finish it. <laughs> let's get this thing over with, you know, and then sure, start something new, but, but let's just get some resolution here. Well, it's, it's that, and that you run the risk of things getting too expansive. Yeah. Or if it's like past five, people are like, man, they really either, depending on the author, it's like they either lost a plot, you know, two books ago, 
or it's like this thing is huge. There's too many details. I can't remember all this stuff. I'm not even going to bother with that. So, right. Yeah. Which guy that's like, um, the, the, that's what comic books in general have had a, a problem with for decades was just that like anytime they would be like, Hey, this looks cool. You want to be a new customer? And they're like, I don't even know where to start. See ya. That's right. Also, yeah. also you're a fucking nerd. So. <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, you you know you're talking about yeah you're talking about seventh grade kids uh, you know so yeah you got a capacity for that. But it it is interesting how the the publishing industry is sort of coalescing around this. Everything has to be a series. Everything has to have a certain number of books, and they all have to be ready to go before the first one's even out. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, and Which, that's where you know we we really did. You know, luck out with with uh, Soviet Endgame because I had the second one was probably about two thirds done before the first one even went to the editor for the first time. Uh, so that really kind of gave us a good backlog. But, you know, that backlog's rapidly running out. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to have yeah. to get my nose to the grindstone to get book three out. Well, uh, Amazon had a lot to do with that. It, in some ways, it gave us a great set of tools. And in other ways, it screwed us. <laughs> well, I mean, that, it, that's the story of every internet uh, sort of company uh, in, in the past 10 years. It's like at first it was the Wild West. People had all these new tools they didn't even know what to do with. Then they everybody started getting in the grindstone. And then there was the, the sort of mainstream publishers or like news agencies or networks or things like that in, in every aspect of culture and pop culture, they felt left out. So then they created this sort of algorithm to sort of get everything back under their control and that stuff. So I'm sure someone at Simon and Schuster, uh, you know, called up Amazon. It's like, Hey, uh, how can, how can we get these sort of uh, this business model back into effect? Yeah, and it's had the effect of basically <clears throat> making it necessary to work like an old style pulp author, or again, work work a day job while you write three books over three years, and yeah. then take a crack at it, and then hope that you make enough of a stir that. It doesn't all go away three months after the third book comes out. And I, I couldn't imagine that approach because, you know, my my original first draft for Advanced Contact uh, was nothing at all like uh, what was published at all. I mean, structure wise, story wise, it, plots were ripped out, plots were added in. And I cannot imagine having you know written three of those. And then gone through that process. I mean, that would have been just an absolute beating. Um, no. You know, the you know even just even just uh, at first glance, just looking at the structure, the second book that I sent out today is is vastly superior to the to the first book in its first form that you know was originally sent out. So, um, you know, there's there's so much learning that you can do with each of these you know with each of these books that uh, especially on the front end of it. I mean, I get it over time. Um, you know, you're, you're going to get into a comfort zone, but for a beginner, you know, trying to break into this thing, the idea of, of trying to write three books, uh, and not having books, you know, one, two and three all suck is, uh, you know, that's a pretty tall order. Well, yeah. Cause you don't, you don't have the feedback from the first book that's to, right. to guide where, where you take this. So right. it's like, you're already locked into, if somebody hates one aspect of your book, or if everybody hates one aspect of your book and you've locked into that for the whole trilogy or five part series or whatever, you're like, Oh man. Yep. So you can either do this really obvious retcon in the second book or, right. 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 Yeah. Or you have do, to restructure four books instead of just scrapping whatever draft you're working on for the sequel. Do what they did with the GI Joe live action movies and just smoke the least care. Uh, the, the least popular main character in the first five minutes and then roll with something else there you go are you talking about the the sequel yeah the one with the rock where they were just like yeah. yeah let's just get rid of the entire lineup from the first movie 
yep, everybody's dead in the first five, 10 minutes. And then we do do something completely different. Still not enough to save that movie, but it was no, better than the first. No. <laughs> that, that, that was a very, very low bar to clear. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I never thought I'd see a, a major studio movie in the the 2000s where somebody comes in and he's just like, oh, yeah, Dr. Mindbender totally told me the truth. And my it's opened my eyes. So I was like, you're supposed to be an intelligence analyst. Like, <laughs> imag- Imagine those words coming out of your mouth. You clearly remember more of that movie than I do. It, that line just sticks out with me. That line and uh, what's her name? Sienna Miller or whatever. Because they tried to make her the love interest for Duke. And I was just. I was upset. <laughs> I was upset when, when I was in the theater and I saw that. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? The one thing I remember about that movie was not seeing it. Good for you. Well, you have seen it. If you saw uh, Return of the Jedi, you saw the G.I. Joe movie. Well, there you go. There you go. They, pull, they pull scenes like straight up out of that, that movie. Uh, probably because Coop has seen it recently. No, I haven't seen it recently. Just I, I remember what I felt when I saw it in the theater, and it was very um, animated of me. <laughs> but. Yeah. But uh, another aspect of the the everything has to be a series before it's the first one's even published is I remember uh, one of the streams we had, Pete, you were saying, it's like, I was really hoping Taiwan wasn't going to clack off for at least the next three weeks because that's when my release date was. So it's yep. like it's like when you're doing like this near future stuff, if if you're just trying to beat whatever the current event is, you can do that one book at a time. If you have to plan out like four or five books ahead on like a a biannual or a, a semi-annual release schedule or something like that, like you're not going to make it. Um, which is why you should do alternate history instead, because then That's everything right. goes out the window. Walk down, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and- I actually i I have a theory that alternate history should be used for all these near future stuff. Like instead of just being like, uh, you know, one or two years from now, this is going to happen because as soon as your book or, or movie or TV show gets released and then that date gets passed, everybody's just looking back and be like, none of that stuff happened. It was like, there's still the CCP in, uh, in, uh, Blade Runner, you know, it's like, but if you go back five years and just change one event, now you're in alternate history. That's right. The, the, the timelines have forked and you're just free to do whatever. Yeah, there there was a there was a series that came out. It was the it's the Iron Crucible. It's I think it's just going to be three books. Two are out, um, and I was not interested at all because uh, it was it takes place in the early '90s and it's a NATO Warsaw Pact. And Nothing like, good came out of the '90s, dude. That that would just be a, a straight on NATO ass whooping. That would have just been you know, a 100% bloodbath. I'm not interested in reading that story. And if you didn't write that story, then you clearly don't know what you're talking about. Um, but then, you know, I got to, I got to tweeting with, uh, with TK Blackwood, the author. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, this is a good dude. And he's really smart. So I should probably give his book a try. And within the first couple of pages, he, he has Brezhnev being assassinated in the, in the early 70s. And so the timeline switched right then and everything made sense after that. And I'm like, oh my God, this is brilliant. This, this book's great. So, oh, yeah. Um, it was, so. it, it was one of the, the good parts about the original Red Dawn was that, you know, everybody looks at the concept and be like, this is ridiculous. This would never happen. It was like, no, if you look at the, the prelude that they right. gave, you know, the, yep. the scrawling text, it's like everything you knew about current events is not happening. You know, it's like right. Ukraine is in a famine. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> right yeah they laid it all out there right in the very beginning and and you know and they literally said you know the u.s stands alone and yeah you know all of and i mean you know without without giving too many spoilers um yeah boy wouldn't that be interesting if uh if the soviets in the in the 80s had managed to really gain a foothold in 
in Central and South America. Boy, that that's sure. I wonder, man. Somebody should probably write something about that. <laughs> and so one of the one of the reviewers of the book actually called it out. He's like, "Oh, it's a prelude to Red Dawn." <laughs> like, well, maybe not quite, but a lot of uh, famous and and popular works of media have become. I have come from that idea of like, I want to make a prequel to this unrelated thing. Right. Uh, which got the, the one that comes to mind is the night of the living dead. That was uh, George Romero read. I am legend. That's right. And wanted to make the, uh, like the story of how the world got that way. Right. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't get the right. So he, he couldn't do vampires. And so he decided to do zombies and he couldn't afford stuntmen, so he decided that they would walk slowly rather than than be running like the the twenty eight days later zombies right. ended up being. Yeah, uh, actually, I am Legend definitely had a huge impact on my life because uh, my old man was stationed in uh, at QB Point in the Philippines, so I was watching the Far East Network when I was in second grade. And the Heston movie, The Omega Man, yep. comes on TV. And oh my God, as a second grader, I just fell in love with that movie. I'm like, did you see that? And spoilers, he dies in the end. And I'm like, oh my God, they killed the main character. Who You're not allowed that? to do that? Right. This violates the Hayes Code. Yeah. <laughs> right. for, me, for me, that was uh, the Cowboys. Oh, yeah. They oh, killed yes. John Wayne. How could That's they do right. that? They can't yep. do that. It's not supposed to happen. Only in the Alamo, and that's because like that for me, it, was, yeah. it was history. Yeah. but uh, it, It's weird how I Am Legend, in every single adaptation they've done, it's never vampires. It's always like either mutants or zombies or mutant zombies. But it's never vampires, which is interesting because the entire point of that book is how can we make vampires scientifically plausible? So, Plus the, the whole legend Thing, the I am legend line doesn't work if it's not a creature of legend, if it's just right. zombies or, or mutants or something. Well, it, it's Hollywood. Hollywood screws up everything it touches. Yeah, but this was back when Hollywood had like half of them still had a mind on their shoulders. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm wow. going to say, you know, while they weren't vampires, you know, the the disco hippie zombie things in I am, or rather in the Omega Man really worked for me as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, These creatures of myth. Well, on the on the alternate history th thing, I, I got because Option Zulu was the book that Coop was talking about on the Taiwan thing, where I was just please don't let Taiwan clack off before I finish this and get it out. Um, and then that, everybody can die. Like <laughs> it's not the first time I've run into that situation either. I, I was in. Uh, 2014, I was writing the evacuation under fire of the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad for Alone and Unafraid while they were going all the chemicals out of the embassy in Baghdad because of the ISIS crisis. Yep. yep. And I sweated bullets over that one for a little while uh, for more than one reason. But... Uh, well, actually, and, I'm running into that even with alternate history because... I've written and and I mean I remember when it actually when the when Ukraine first kicked off I remember thinking you know oh well we'll see how this goes but but my my big quote you know leading into that when before the shooting even started was never underestimate the red army's ability to trip over their own dick and and now it's playing out and I'm like ah shit all right well I've just I've just written you know 130,000 words of a competent Soviet red army <laughs> That's your ultimate so, history. Right, right. So it's like, well, yeah. you know, what we're looking at today is really degraded compared to what they could have done back in 1980. Trust me, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever read a uh, uh, play Red Alert, the Command and Conquer? Yes. Off game? yes. Yeah. So that's all alternate history and that stuff. And I, I love yep. the fact that what they had to do was – basically just rewrite history post world war ii to make the soviets an actual threat on the in the game right yep. just... you're not the first one alex <laughs> actually, actually and, and you have a clancy show 
I think this was uh, severely uh, underrated. I don't know if you guys know this one. The War That, the never, war that was. never Was? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Is, uh, Michael Palmer. It's pretty interesting. It's uh, it's it's similar. It's it's in the early 90s, late 80s. Um, it's pretty good. It's mostly uh, kind of third person, omniscient, kind of telling the history uh, you know, of the war that never happened. Uh, but yeah, that one, that one's pretty good. And, and yeah, I mean, for anybody that writes a cold war goes hot book to, to deny that red storm rising, you know, wasn't one of their, their, your favorite fap novels of all time, you know, they're, they're lying and there's a lot there. There's more of us than I expected, um, you know, taking this on. Um, I don't know. Have you guys uh, ever seen the world war three, 1987 blog? I can't say that. I okay, it, yeah, it's it, it's you know probably a little obscure, but uh, the the guy who writes that blog is is running into the problem because he actually got under contract with a publisher to to write it up as a as a novel, and as it was going through editing and getting ready for publication, Ukraine kicked off, and the publisher was like, "Nope, we're not putting this out." Yeah. So so right now he's he's doing exactly what you're talking about. He's sweating it because the second book was about uh, you know an, an invasion of Taiwan, and so he's just checking his watch. Come on now, you know, just release <laughs> that one first, and then uh, and then yeah. release the other one as a prequel. You know. Yeah, ex ex exactly something. But uh, and and I'm, I think they're just waiting for for you know Russia to cool off, and they'll 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 put it out sooner or later. Yeah. But that's why I'm glad Frontline uh, Publishing wasn't didn't shy away from throwing this uh, you know this one out there. You know, yeah, did you have them ask us like, is there any Russian character that is sympathetic because we can't have that? Or no, they they didn't. And and you know, I had, on Monroe Doctrine uh, we had several sympathetic Russian characters, um, and you know, it was kind of important to to kind of try to say, and and I think the storylines definitely were doing this, which is say. Uh, you know, they're just people, man. They're just people, and they do. You're not allowed do. to say that. Every Russian is the devil incarnate. That's right. Even well, their, even their astronauts that are working hand right. in hand with ours. Even that's their right. sports athletes. They're Hitler as well. They're that's well, right. You can't call them Stalin because that would imply that Stalin was a bad man. Uh, but they're, yeah, they're just terrible. Right. I think it's acceptable to say Barry was a bad man. No, none of them know who Barry is. Yeah, probably not. But of course he was a bad man because like he was undermining Stalin, the, the true mastermind. So there's an interesting theory I ran into about the death of Stalin. Not the movie, the actual event. All right. Beria was the last one to see him alive. Beria's Beria presumably already saw the writing on the wall that he was about to go the same way as Yezhov and Yagoda. Who were the for those listening? Yezhov and Yagoda were the the two heads of the NKVD for the beginning phases of the Great Purge, when just thousands and thousands of Russians were disappeared into the Gulag or executed. Now, well, that narrows it down. <laughs> well, Beria took over he was probably going to be next he was the last one to see stalin alive and, and he was known to have the habit of carrying a blackjack in his pocket and the way, stalin, the way stalin do, died could have been caused by a contusion to the brain from the strike yeah but, but pete they would have they would have known that he had suffered blunt force trauma. Any competent doctor would have. Oh, never mind. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, Barry I mean, ended up getting shot anyway. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to say that your theory is implausible, considering who Barry was. So, but. Uh... but yeah, the... that, that's that's what you can do with alternate history, though, is you can you can take a theory that that you've just heard somewhere and just be like, OK, what if this happened or what would it take to make this happen? What what effects would that have? And then you have this horrible butterfly effect, which has to be reined in, which uh, Alex, if you want to 
go in on that because I have no yeah. idea how to. Well, you know, it, I, I kind of have a little bit of regret uh, in, in the way that I structured the story because the point of departure is so close to the to the beginning of the story. And, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, the point of departure was really, really vague because I didn't care, um, which, you know, I probably shouldn't say that out loud. Um, but but ultimately, it wasn't Eagle Claw going correctly that was the point of departure because I didn't think that that was ever going to happen. Um, it was actually the Shaw refusing to leave and still trying to run the um, the, the secular government under Prime Minister Bakhtiar. Uh, that was the point of departure. And so instead of him, you know, leaving and the Ayatollah coming right back in, you know, as soon as as soon as he boogied out. Um, you know, that kind of made the uh, revolution drag on, which is what caused the Soviets to say, oh, we have an opportunity here. Let's, you know, let's take advantage of it. Um, no, they would never. What's that? They would never. No, no, of course not. Um, but but so what I'm saying, though, is that because the point of departure is right on right at the beginning of the book, you don't have a lot of opportunity to play with with a lot of this stuff until you know, the second, you know, going into the second book is the first time where I feel like I'm really seeing a lot of um, subtle changes. Like there are some real obvious changes, you know, where, I mean, you know, again, spoiler alert, we end up at war with Nicaragua in the book. Um, you know, I, I remember that that didn't actually happen. Um, so, so there are definitely big changes, but it's the subtle ones that I think are fun. Um, like for example, and, and, you know, again, whatever, mild spoilers. But uh, one of my favorites in the second book is that because uh, McDonnell Douglas needs to keep churning out phantoms to replace combat losses, they have to sideline the uh, F-18. Well, now we have a pileup of, of engines that were being built for the F-18. Well, what are we going to do with those? Oh, well, Northrop is still building F-5s on the Pacific. So we're just going to re-engine those with the F-18 engines. And does anybody know what that's called? It's the uh, that's the uh, F twenty one Tiger Shark. So oh yeah, okay. So, so in, in their the timeline, they're going to re-engine those. They're going to give them the Sparrow missiles, and it'll be the F five G. And and you know, so the so in my timeline, I get to make the F twenty one work. So I'm pretty happy with that. The, the light fighter mafia got their way. Yep. Yeah. And well, I they mean, should. <laughs> it was it was really it, it's hard to argue you know what do you want and you know the, the f5 at the end of its life life lifespan this is the as good as this airframe is going to get or the f16 which is you know brand new and and just at the beginning of its potential um you know and that's to say nothing of the hornet um which i mean you know, as a Navy guy, I love that plane, man. You know, I didn't want to put that thing on the sideline, but now it's just relegated to, you know, I think like what two Marine Corps attack squadrons, I think is, is where it's going to ultimately end up. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's, and, and then that's where I find so much of the fun, you know, in the alternate history is, is to come up with, with, you know, ways that, that things would, would break differently on a more subtle level. You know, um, that's not war with Nicaragua. That is, you know, one of Alex's favorite airframes actually gets to go into production. You know, you know nuclear Aegis. That's probably a thing that's going to happen. You know, so. <laughs> uh, I do tend to do a lot more of the, the near future type stuff, except as a safeguard, I never attach a date to it. And that's smart. I am a slave to my dates. James makes fun of me all the time because uh, every scene is dated. Sometimes there's a timestamp. <laughs> yeah. And and it's, with, it... with alternate history, you can do that. Even with some near future science fiction, I think if you push it far enough out, like 30, 40 years, you can. I'm, pretend... I'm telling you, man, you just have to mix the two concepts. And it's it's totally underutilized. Just go back five years, change one thing. You're on alternate history and your near future. Well, in some ways, I kind of, in some ways, I kind of did that with Black Hearts because I, mean, I I made it kind of made it clear to anybody who was paying attention with the very first book that this is not quite the world as we know it because the island kingdom of Cudark in the uh, 
Persian Gulf does not actually exist. Right. That may be a shock to some people, but no, it's there. There is an actual island where I placed it, but it's about a, the actual rock is maybe an eighth of the size of what I described, and there's no ancient citadel on it or anything yet. But, well, uh, your, he, uh, Mike and Larry did the same thing with Dead Six, though. There's, oh, yeah. um, you know, Zubara is on an actual territory. It's just not called Zubara, and it's not its own. There's territory. nothing on it. You can, you can actually throw in. It's like, oh yeah, Shanghai has been nuked like three times. <laughs> you can actually go on Google Earth and find that that triple peninsula that they describe for mm -hmm. Zubara and Dead Six. There is nothing on it. Right, but it didn't uh, didn't some reviewer uh, be like like they're talking about a civil war in China? There there hasn't been a civil war in China in like fifty years. It's like, yeah, man, uh, mm -hmm. welcome to the conversation. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's where James was getting in. He, he got lit on fire in. Uh, he's still getting lit on fire for uh, that book he wrote uh, a couple years back called Rigged. I mean, he wrote it like 10 years before, or I'm sorry, a year before the 2020 election. And all he did was hypothesized about ways that, that there could be voter fraud and how, you know, uh, a, a concerted effort could create, you know. Um, well, you know, yeah, when he wrote it, all the articles about how that was possible were still published. They got ceremoniously <laughs> unpublished about two years ago, and and now and and now you know he still gets reviews every now and again that are like you know this is absolute you know Trump fetish you know fetish material. Oh, it's and a it's threat like, to our democracy, like, bro. It had nothing to do with that, man. It was an exercise in possibility. Yeah, no, no, it's it's kind of like they even knew that Trump was going to run back then. Right. Well, almost, it's almost as good as the very first review we got for Spot Reps. The uh, the Maelstrom Rising anthology that uh, James was actually uh, wrote one of the stories for that that collection. For for what was it? Uh, Spot Reps was the uh, uh, anthology I put together for the Maelstrom Rising series. Okay. And James James wrote one of the stories in it. I want that review framed. <laughs> <laughs> Just get very you first, you me and Mike have brought that up so many times. <laughs> very first review. Pretty sure it was somebody who had a beef with one of the other authors because I've never, never seen any input from this person before. But uh, it was basically complaining that it wasn't the sequel to the Turner Diaries. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> nice. Alex, that's some hot sports opinion right there. Too much civ nattery, which means civic nationalism. Right, as opposed to yeah. like racial nationalism or something like that. What was what was the other weird de depths of the racist dark web uh, term he used that we couldn't figure out for like a day? I don't know. I'm. You guys uh, carry on your conversation. I'm going to look this up. Coop's going to do some research here. Yeah. Well, I, I got I, I got nuked in in uh, with advanced contact. Uh, because I wasn't mean enough to Jimmy Carter, which which really makes me laugh because like I'm the guy that not only thought Carter was a bad president, I hated him after his presidency and and fuck that Habitat for Humanity. I, I don't care. He's associated to it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> um, I'll do you one better. I think he's a terrible peanut farmer too. That probably sucks at that, right? I ain't seen any Jimmy Carter peanuts around. He sucks so, at everything else. So, you know, it's like I don't like this guy, but I'm writing a book, dude. So, yep. and and I know, and so so I know that that the Reaganites are are just you know waiting to light me on fire because you know I make I write Jimmy Carter in a sympathetic fashion. Well, spoilers in book two, George W. Bush is going to show up, and I'm going to get lit on fire by the left. So I'm pretty excited yeah. about having everybody mad at me. Well, and actually, I will say this. Yeah, the, the guy, the, the guy, I got one starred by a guy who said Jimmy Carter would be a terrible wartime president. I'm like, welcome to the series I'm writing. <laughs> uh, Pete, was it Naxaltz? Yes. Yeah. Somebody figured out what it meant too, and I can't remember now. Um, I don't know. Uh, so, so, so the full context oh. here. This is this is a one star review. Um. 
Full Bore Magic Exceptions Save the Magic Republic uh, by opting out. Neilan's previous books have had their share of magic naxalts, but his Civ Nattery has turned to Clown World. Murica in this anthology is a land of Hispanic gangbangers, evil Nazi. Uh, they spell it N O T S E E. So they're trying to, to dodge an algorithm here. Right, right. Evil Nazi white nationalists, uh, Black Panthers, and the good guys. Like, I mean, yeah. were, you, were you expecting a mixture there or just <laughs> uh, Hispanics and Blacks and goofy white boys wearing the magic uniform? So it's the fact that they're part of the armed services or a wow. uniform band fighting together rather than just a gang war. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, there is no sense of honor or a cause. Pete, how dare you? You, you didn't put honor in your spot reps anthology? Funny, I thought we did, but uh, I think this guy has a, a little bit different definition for words. Yeah. I, I, I can tell because the next line is, so there is no sense of honor or a cause, and the evil is dot, 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 wait for it. So, my God, Marxism and communism. That's that's a legit, I'm, okay, I mean, that works for me. That's my go-to for evil. That's um, right. His Which noble wonder, good guys, it, righteous it, because Neelan and the other authors imagined people like them back in the day, are the only thing holding back chaos in the streets. By providing chaos and forcing someone... To take a stand. The only thing they dislike is disorder. I just can't read this crap anymore. Well, I'm sold. I, I mean, I already bought it. Yeah. But. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he never read any of my stuff to begin with. <clears throat> like well, I said, uh, he obviously a, has, or she obviously has, because she knows that all your previous books have had their share of magic naxalts. <laughs> Whatever the hell that means. I still don't know. And I'm pretty sure that was a bold-faced lie in the first place, but yeah. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> Maybe they do give yeah. your name because or else I'd be like it. Maybe they're talking about a different book entirely. Like the, the one guy that reviewed the lost, oh, the man, first book was... in a series. And he says it's worse than the other books in the series. <laughs> yeah. Whoopsie. And, and then goes into plot points that have nothing whatsoever to do with. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was disappointed that you went through the, uh, and you wasted so much time on a romance angle in the first book where there is no romance angle. No, there, there's just fighting monsters and people dying and horrible sorcery. Okay, yeah. it's a little romantic. I get you. <laughs> but uh, right. I'm looking this up in case uh, the FBI comes knocking on my door. Um, hmm. A oh. Naxalt. We oh. see that door behind Coop bust open. <laughs> I don't yeah, even have a dog, and they still shot it. Uh, not all X are like that. That's what that means. So it's it's anytime you don't dig real deep into a stereotype and depict anybody like that. So okay. and now I'm starting to wonder if this was a a, 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 ra a racial nationalist or just a complete out of left field leftist. It sounds like. It was those are, are overlapping far I, more than we like. I think there's a lot of room in that Venn diagram. Right Man, uh, if only a country came to mind. Um, <laughs> South Africa, no. No, no. Rhodesia, no. China, no. Okay, so what was uh, the China. Thing, What was the one thing that you've that you've looked up researching? Where you were really glad you had a VPN because you knew the NSA was going to be knocking on your door. Uh, mostly explosive stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, or or, or it's, it's like it's like, hmm, how does this human trafficking business actually work? You know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for, yeah. For me, it was uh, what's the best way to blow up a fertilizer plant. I thought, oh well, thank goodness for the VPN because yeah, is, this yeah. does not look good. Uh, no, it, it just makes it look worse because now you're trying to hide it, right? That's right. I remember when when the movie, oh my goodness, this was uh, late 90s. It was Will Smith, Enemy of the State. Yeah. I remember when Enemy of the State came out and I had just gotten off of active duty 
I'm watching this movie and I'm like, fellas, that ain't the NSA. I don't know who that is, but I've worked with the NSA and I'm here to tell you, brother. Mm, well, they no. got they got like Seth Green and Jack Black in there and they're all just like, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like this, this is the best we can do. So you can't even see his face because he's not looking up. It's like, well, maybe you should build better satellite. It's like, no, <laughs> it's like, dude, they, <laughs> like they're still in uniform, man. Oh. Uh, Pete, well, Pete, what uh, research have you done that you're just like mm, this this stuff's gonna bite me in the ass because like like i remember you were researching sites that could plausibly serve as as locations in your uh, maelstrom rising books and just like does this look wow. like it could be a black site or something i was like i, I think it is <laughs> like, <laughs> well that was just that was just looking at uh, google earth uh which was le less useful over communist China than, than most of the rest of the world, but it, it still gave me, okay, that kind of looks like it could work. Um, yeah, I, actually, that really, really, really torqued me. Um, when China first started building up the, the dry dock to build the, uh, the 003 aircraft carrier, I was Johnny on the spot. I, I found exactly where that mf -er was going to be. And and I would go and I'd refresh and and they would they were updating it you know for a while and then basically as soon as it got interesting, same image every time, yeah. never updated. Now that thing's yeah. you know on sea trials or whatever the hell it's doing. They don't even have Street View anymore. Ah. You know what was interesting to see what country doesn't have Street View, for most of it anyway. It's Germany. Like interesting. I could get down into street view in some very obscure parts of Mexico to plot firefights, but Germany was overheads only for most of it. I, here's the thing. I, I don't want to give them credit, but it might be that they're still um, sensitive about a bunch of surveillance in the streets of Germany. I think a lot of it. <laughs> why would they be? Why on earth would that be? <laughs> Well, here's the thing. A lot of what Germany's done, I'm just like, you're just repeating yourselves now. But for some things, they're they are overly sensitive to the point that they'll overreact in the complete other direction. So. Yeah. I think I think a lot of it has to do with EU privacy laws more than anything else. Yeah. I don't, well, have you I tried it in like France or another EU country? A um, little bit. Okay. Czech Republic wasn't too difficult. Uh, it seems to be more Germany than most of the rest. But I think some of these countries view the letter of those privacy laws in different ways, too. It's not quite the big happy family that they want everybody to think it is. Which I, I may or may not have written a few things about in the past. Uh, I mean, imagine wanting Britain back. <laughs> <laughs> When I was, was uh, doing Monroe Doctrine, I was able to street view all the way up to the main barracks of, uh, what was it, the, the uh, Russian 53rd Naval Infantry Brigade in uh, Vladivostok. I mean, I just walk right up to the, hey, look, there's the building. Isn't that great? Yeah. That's right. The building's still there. They're not anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're... Which is probably why. They've ripped all the plumbing <laughs> out and sold it on the scrap market. Oh, yeah. No, they're uh, using those as weapons. Yeah. <laughs> New tank guns. I, I will point out that if what you did, read what did the Russian doctrine, go ahead. What did the Russian army use before the T sixty two? Well, I mean they had the T fifty five. The T eighty. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I knew where the joke was going. Yep. I forgot the more modern model, though. So I was just like, <laughs> I've, you know, and for me, I'm, I'm stuck in, uh, in brain mode because I've been writing T55 scenes left and right uh, because I have a, a Polish uh, uh, armored uh, brigade uh, or armored division as one of the units that they're following. So hey, don't worry. Now you're gonna have like live action video to use for. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That, that's gonna be great for the ads. <laughs> Just, just take screenshots of that and yeah. throw it in like the AI art thing. You've got a new cover. That's right. Yeah. 
just a little bit selective on the clips so that the clown show that is the modern Russian army isn't quite as obvious. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, at the beginning of the thing, I was predicting underperformance. In fact, I went so far as to say I didn't think they were going to invade outside of the eastern uh, uh, area just because they would be afraid of underperforming on the international stage. And so they would they would concentrate where they knew they had public support, um, you know, the Russian ethnic areas and that they wouldn't mess with anything in the east. And I mean, I was wrong, but mm, I was kind of right. <laughs> Well, I've got a better there, track record than some Russian generals, so I mean, exactly. I, I think there may be some some merit to the theory that was floating around a few months ago, after like what 150 FSB officers got shit canned. Yep, that, we were talking about it with James. Yeah, that the FSB was supposed to bribe enough of the Ukrainian government that they just fold as soon as the tanks rolled across the border. They didn't figure it was ever going to happen, so they pocketed the money. And... As you do. Yeah. Yeah, have you met a Russian? And then it happened. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man, I, you know, and that is, that, that is the, the thing that separates um, the West from everybody else is that while we have corruption, we don't have corruption on the scale that everybody else is corrupt. You know, we, we no, think that... And I've, I've said the same thing about like military prowess because everybody, people rightfully look at the U.S. and be like, that is the greatest military on earth right now, probably undefeatable. It's like, sure, but it's not because we're good because I've, I've served in the military. We are beyond stupid. It's just that everybody else sucks worse at it, like, which is scary, well, I mean, but, you know. And, and it comes down to that, that, that whole element of corruption, you know. When when you take all that that diesel that you were supposed to use to to run your you know your run your equipment every year and you sell it on the black market, all of a sudden your shit's going to fall apart after mm -hmm. you know a couple of weeks in the field. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. that's just insane. Well, I remember I was doing some research on uh, to try to figure out gen general Russian tactics. This was a few years ago when I was looking back on book four of uh black hearts because that was i put that one in transnistria that little breakaway one of in the hindsight Soviet i can say you already overthought it <laughs> well what i found which i can't the 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 video in particular has been erased from youtube anyway it was a video of a live fire exercise of some i don't remember which guards army or something like that and i'm sitting there watching this like wow this is a clown show, even back then. It's like their CQB is jump into the fatal funnel, fire a three-round burst through the door, and then run in. <clears throat> Have you considered that they've already gassed the place? <laughs> well, the only way that could work. <laughs> well, it depends. Do they have hostages or not? No, wait, no, it doesn't. <laughs> they did. But, but it's, it's not even just like the regular forces. Because uh, you remember the the mystique of, uh, uh, you know, grew and, and, um, what was it? Spetsnaz and all that. It was like, Oh man, in their training, they allow for like this many dead, dead guys. And this many casualties <laughs> they are way harder than the U S I was like, yeah, but looking at what they do, it was like, they didn't have to allow that. They, That's right. Yeah. It was mostly just, negligent discharges. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm looking at their, uh, uh, their, their tactical pistol courses and that stuff. And they basically just have cardinal direction Ivan targets there in the middle. And then their instructor is just like punching them while calling out targets to shoot. And it was like, first off, the guy nd like five times in the video <laughs> it, itself. Um, and this is what they chose to, to put out as the propaganda. Uh, the other thing I was like, dude, he flagged everybody. He flagged the cameraman. He flagged every no shoot target. He flagged the guy punching him, which... At that point, is it still flagging? But, you know, um, it's like, dude, they're, they're on some. The Israelis are more trustworthy with their tactics than than the Russians are with that. Yeah. Are you guys are you guys familiar with Russian mill pop? Yeah. Mil military. Pop channel, that sounds like something Mike's shown us. It, 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 so 
I like to listen to music to kind of put me in a place when I'm writing. So when I was writing um, Advanced to Contact, I was listening to a lot of uh, <laughs> 1979, 1980s pop music. You know, it's like put you in a, in a spot. Well, when I was doing Monroe Doctrine, I'm like, all right, let's see what the Russians have got because I'm writing Russian characters in a modern context. And I'll be damned if and I, this must be changing. But um, yeah, there's a whole genre of military pop music where they they put out videos and and they're they're rapping as hard as they can rap and and there's you know shooting going on and and you know you can see the the guys jumping off of the BDKs taking the beach and um, it's 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 fascinating stuff. But one of the earliest examples I saw of this was a song about the VDV by a Russian pop artist who was in the VDV years ago and you're watching this video and they're doing the training. And I am not kidding, man, a dude like jumps an obstacle. And as soon as he hits the ground, Indy, <laughs> you're like, have and this you is what seen, you're showing us. This is what you want us to see. Have you seen the re lyricing of that video? <laughs> no, this came, this came out very shortly after the invasion kicked off. <laughs> VDV lost like all of them. Right. <laughs> and so somebody went back and just changed the uh, the subtitles. Right. Easy to do. More fitting of recent events. That's. <laughs> oh, it, it That's was great. Uh, uh, let's see. And then, uh, which got like. Pete and I saw one where they they got like this this famous Russian um, singer. She's you know very gorgeous and all that. They dress her up in like this uh, pseudo aristocrat sort of olive drab green you know dress, and have her sing about Spetsnaz and how glorious they are and and how you know great Russia is. And we're looking at it and we're just like, dude, dude these are this is like five eleven gear. Oh, there's <laughs> a of Russian gear. Like what? the only thing that wasn't U.S. designed were the yeah. AK. Yeah. The no, only. those were probably Jim Fuller too. If you if you really want to look at uh, Century Arms. <laughs> <laughs> but oh uh, yeah, dude that that VDV video. Uh, oh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And then I, I'm and then I'm I sure, but that. That's the one that I know very uh, intimately because it was the most hilarious thing I saw after the uh, the evasion kicked off. That's fantastic. I, you know, and that thing's been around forever. I mean, yeah. I think it was 2009 the first time I saw that. It sounds like, but it still looks like it's it was shot in the 80s. On, like, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And in, as a matter of fact, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's like an after school special. Wow! <laughs> They're flagging everybody. <laughs>
that's great, man. Uh, the C-Ed uh, guitar solo. <laughs> Crown it off. See, back when people were just doing that stuff, that was hilarious. And then people made a hashtag to, to be like, oh, we're fighting the meme war against Russia. And we're actually making a difference. And we're like, oh, no, 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 you're being funny. Yeah. I was going to, dude, funny. even some Very Taliban uh, social media accounts had some pretty fire memes too. But it's like, it's like that didn't, that didn't make us lose anybody over there. Right. Very our own guys. people have a very inflated sense of their own importance yeah. and effectiveness. Just look at all the meltdowns on Twitter over the last few weeks. It's glorious. Got to say, it's been the most fun that, that Twitter's been since uh, since yeah. I've been on. And frankly, I mean, you know, I thought Twitter I was such a garbage uh, you know site to begin with. It wasn't until actually Ukraine that I got back on it. Um you know, and that was just for the, uh, you know, open source intelligence. Yeah, dude, a lot of the OSINT uh, accounts for Ukraine were freaking the hell out when Elon bought it. They were saying, this yeah. is over. This is the end of the OSINT community. I was like, why? Like, well, what did Elon, no. what do you other think Elon people, was going to do about Yeah, other that? people are going to say shit that you don't want to hear. That's the only difference. Now it's here. Just start curating your feed, man. It's, it's that easy. You know, Twitter's only as toxic as you want it to be. Yeah, well, th that's the thing. It's like whenever they're like, they're, they're bringing Trump back. I was like, you can still block him. Like, yeah. that's right. And I mean, come on, man. He's not coming back. He has yeah. no incentive to come back. <laughs> and I know Elon's trying to, to tease him enough to get him to come back. But, you know, brother has true social and he wants to drive people to it. So why on earth would he give it away for free yeah. on Twitter? So. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he'll he'll prove me wrong. But no, I, I think if he's smart, he'll <clears throat> he'll give his Twitter account to like whoever's on his staff or something to like get snippets from Truth and put it on there. And just be right. like, see what you guys are missing or anything. Just yeah. and that would that would give him the same reach he, that he had during his 2016 run, which was kind of vital to him winning. So sure his, his whole his whole twitter feed is just screen josh from truth yeah <laughs> exactly right uh, wait sh shit a lot of uh the uh the twitter accounts that are the most successful are just his tweets from like 10 years or more ago back when he before he picked up politics as a hobby didn't care he was just gonna say whatever he wanted to say and they are hilarious especially in hindsight yeah yeah so but, where were we Bef before we went to the vdv we? <laughs> it was the, the ultimate <laughs> history and like uh yeah. divergence you know like what did they use before the the t60 and all that so I don't know. Sometimes the, the near future stuff can be fun just from speculation. Sometimes looking at, yep, see, called it like the, uh, the M5. I called it something else, but I still figured that the, uh, the SIG entry in the next generation squad weapons uh, competition was probably going to be the one. And lo and behold, I was right. No. Well, I mean, I wanted them to win just because I was already an MCX fanboy. I was since they introduced it. But when you saw what the other competitors were, you're yeah. just like, oh, no, SIG's going to run away with this. Like, there, there's no way we're going to a freaking bullpup. Like, or, a, or a fancy experimental semi-caseless whatever it was Textron had going. They've on. been trying to do that for like 30 years, and they still haven't done it, so... If the G11 couldn't work, if the, the Kraut Space Magic G11 wasn't going to do it. I'm convinced all the rave, like, uh, you know, the field reviews about how it was so much better, that's just fake or a mistranslation of German. like, Or just German propaganda. Well, like I said, a mistranslation of German. <laughs> so how much have you gotten to play with uh, the, the small arms in... Uh, Soviet in game, Alex. 
Really, I don't pay that much attention. In fact, I actually, um, and I got I got lit up for this one. Uh, fortunately, it was a friend of mine, um, and I handed out some uh, M16A2s uh, way too early. And so uh, I had some three-round bursts coming where there ought not be any. And so oh, uh, yes. so they're just really good at trigger discipline. They <laughs> That's right. Not- That's right. <laughs> they knew in that third shot. Yeah, got got to stop. But, but you know what? You know, I'll own it, man. You know that was, uh, I and and again, you know, and that wasn't the only uh, anachronism I had. Um, I also and and this one is just pure laziness. Um, but I also still had some like Third Infantry Division Sheridan tanks in in Germany when, in fact, only the 82nd Airborne had Sheridans at the time. It's like, ah, oh, damn it! You know, it's the things you don't think about. And I know where that came from too, and I'm so annoyed because, like, I intentionally didn't reread Red Storm. I intentionally didn't read, you know, Hackett's World War III book or you know Croyle's Team Yankee. I didn't reread any of that stuff because I knew that it was going to get in my head and I was going to accidentally write it. So at one point, though, I thought, what if it's already in your head? And you accidentally write it. So you should probably read some of this stuff. So I picked up Hackett's World War III book and I was reading and it's like, oh, yeah, Sheridan's in, in 1987, sure, whatever. All right. And then I didn't think anything of it until this guy reaches out and he's Rick's like, bro, that's not a thing. And I'm like, oh my God, that was totally because I was reading this stupid book. What the hell's wrong with me? You know, in lieu of research, I took a guy writing a book in like 1977 about a war in 1986 and thought, oh, yeah, sure. That's how it's going to work. So, If only you could change history for the sake of your story. (laughs) (laughs) Right. That's kind of a deep dig. Well, you see, when the Shaw said that he wasn't going to leave, the army said, oh, well, then we should put Sheridans back in Germany. Sure. Yeah. Where else are you going to put them? (laughs) What else were you going to do? So, uh, those, those are the two big ones. Um, and then, yeah, so for, for the, for the small arm stuff, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, I mean, cause it's 1980. So, no. you know, what are you really talking? You got your M16s, your M60s, you got your, uh, you know, 1911s. You know, where are you going from there? You know, the, the Russians, every. <laughs> Every spare Russian has a Makarov and, uh, and you know, a, a couple of the different AKs, depending. So you, you, I've got a, um, a fearsome VDV squad in there. And so so they're going to have uh, some of the, what is it, the uh, the AKMs? No, AKS? Shit, I can't remember uh, now. AKS it's the one with the folding stock. And, uh, 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 by then, 74 the the S was for the folding stock, so that would have been that would okay. have been AKS. Um, by 1980, a lot of them, a lot of them would have switched over to 74s. Right. Where they're uh, shooting the the poison bullet. Uh, and the, uh, the seven N six. The the you might have had the 74U by that point, which interestingly, even the Spetsnaz actually hated that that weapon because it was so short that it was wildly inaccurate oh yeah and it's half flamethrower yeah <laughs> and, it's half flamethrower. and uh apparently their nickname for it was suchka the bitch little bitch little bitch <laughs> but th- to be fair that's their nickname for like almost everything <laughs> right. well, yeah. And and Bliat, let's not forget that. <laughs> Look at that. I'm uh, still I'm still trying to find like new reasons to send you guys that music video. <laughs> the most Russian video ever. Yeah, yeah. It was like definitely not a Russian music video. Yeah, yeah. What is it? Oh, it's uh somebody so some Russian uh internet band made this uh like Trap. I I don't know the correct EDM subgenre, but it's like some some dubstep trap music thing. Sure, but it it's called Sukablat. Like it's 
that's the name of the song. That's the point of the song. That's pretty and much the entire lyrics. Yeah. And that, but somebody took ev- like pretty much every viral uploaded Russians being stupid video on the internet and just compiled it into a music video for it. Nice. Yeah. 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 And with the, uh, it, it gets sent out every once in a while. Well, because uh, Mike will always send us uh, a clip of just just something that comes out of Russia, and he's like, "It's like this is the most Russian thing I've seen all day." I was like, "Is it now?" <laughs> all right, let's pull this one out of storage, which is very is Russian most, in and of itself. Just here is the most Russian music video. And every now and then you have to take things out of mothballs. Eh, we lost Alex. We got too close to the truth, man. Just... Yeah. We haven't even getting that, gotten into the, the deep politics stuff yet. <laughs> uh, an hour 16 in. Uh, here he is. Ah, sorry, I think that was me. All right. <laughs> We were just saying it. Uh, we hadn't even gotten into the deep politics stuff yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As soon as, as soon as that happens, that's when uh, you're going to see there's going to be a pink flash from this side of the screen that takes me out completely, and you'll have met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, both sides buy books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but which side has the most money? Because the Russians don't, and <laughs> Ukraine true. lost all theirs in FTX in a crypto pyramid scheme. So. <laughs> they've got all my money. <laughs> well, they've got all my tax money. That's for that's sure. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> but hey, on the bright side, at least it's clean, and that's what I was worried about. That's that's right. Now it's yeah. this was too dirty and not laundered. Why am I now hearing Joe Pesci saying it is no laundered? <laughs> because yeah, the lethal weapon theory is completely <laughs> underrated. Uh, those really were kind of I mean you look at them from a somewhat more knowledgeable perspective. And I think those movies were hurt by the by Danny Glover's uh, involvement a great deal, but they were still pretty good action movies. Oh yeah, they they were inspirational for me. So like growing up, I saw it like way earlier than I should have. Like it was just on TV or something. And when I say uh, earlier than I should have, I'm not saying like I was too immature to to really understand. So I. I just went and copied all their bad habits. No, it's like I was so young. I thought every action movie took place with a shootout in the desert. Um, and like like you had snipers just shooting guys while they're running through the sand, trying to get behind cover and that stuff. I thought every movie had to have that. Like it was required by Hollywood. When, when we first locked down for the pandemic – we instituted a, uh, a new family activity in the house. So um, I have a 23-year-old uh, and a 15-year-old, so back them up a couple of years. Uh, the 21-year-old was going to college locally here at uh, the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, so she was still living at the house. And every Tuesday, we called it Torture Tuesday, and we sat the girls down in the media room and, and put on an 80s movie. And uh, and absolutely, Lethal Weapon was uh, was on there. And how is that torture? It, so, well, it's torture for them. I think and for us, it's fantastic. If I could get paid to do it, I would. Like <laughs> Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, Tango and Cash, Predator, Rambo. Yeah, I was sad because I was just pulling the trigger on Predator when when basically the girls were going back to school and. Yeah. You know, we just kind of stopped doing it. So. Did you get to commando? No, no. I, I'm gonna have to admit. You know, I mean, you got to turn my man card in a little bit. I didn't pull too many action punches, and we, and they are girls after all. So we did watch, uh, you know, a few more uh, 
romantic uh, teen comedies than, uh, than than the hardcore movies. But you know, at least Lethal Weapon made it. So that's the best you could do because that's it, really, if you think about it, the second one is a teenage romantic comedy. There, with there the is a lot of that to it. On top of that, with Joe Pesci. Right? Yeah, with Joe Pesci. Hey, fuck you in the drive-thru. <laughs> I, I still I still live by that advice to this day. But just the comparison if that character with his usual repertoire, like in Goodfellas or Casino, he's got a dude's head in a vice. Right. <laughs> Oh yeah, that, his performance of that is tame by by yeah. every scene. Some somebody uh, made a meme of it's just a screenshot of the scene from Goodfellas where Tommy gets walks through the door and gets shot in the back of the head, and it's when you think you're up for the promotion board. <laughs> Sounds about right. Oh, yeah. I thought you were talking about the one where it's like he's walking in and it's uh his head's replaced by uh Sam Bankman Freed and every everybody else is like Biden, Harris, uh Pelosi, all that. But because that, that really is some mafia shit that, that's going on. No. Well, Oh, we, we got the uh, yeah. Russian bots. Yeah, the Russian bots popped back into the chat. Oh, is that you guys looking at the live stream? Yeah. Yeah. We've uh, we've gotten a couple of uh, spam attacks from AI. Uh, not not to the extent of the Monroe Doctrine, but... Um, right. Some very, very interesting spam bots. Yeah, yeah. It's it's amazing how many smoking hot Chinese ladies want to be my friend. Yeah. Well, they're done with Eric Swalwell. So that's right. That's right. They got everything they could out of him. Yeah. They didn't have to dig too deep for that. That's a good point. No. Oh, uh, which got somebody pointed out that that same Fang Fang, that same agent, uh, was also involved in a honeypot with. He was like the mayor of some city, but the guy, like Jerry Nadler, has him beat on on looks. <laughs> and and Jack Posobiec pointed out, he's like, "You will never love anything in your life as much as this woman loves China." <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's like yeah, they're everywhere, man. Uh, you gotta watch out, because they're not—they're not just bots anymore. Now it really is like freaking Tong agents and. Yeah, I promise you, I don't rate the actual agents. I just rate bots. <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much. Same here. There's been some weird stuff uh, popped up. Somebody, uh, somebody I know, uh, ran this past me. I wasn't directly involved, but. Uh, some random Afghan dude was uh, hitting him up about trying to get in touch with another dude who worked Afghanistan for years. And yeah, dude, that was me. Yeah. I sent you that. I, I was like, hey, do, right. do, we, do we know what's I wasn't going sure on? if that was you or Chris. No. But yeah, so there, there, there's definitely some sketchy stuff going on out there. Oh, yeah. I, it, it's almost like you know, which guy has anybody actually answered a phone call in the past two or three years because every time it's some scam call right like it's it's a, a automated voice or it's somebody from india insisting that your extended warranty needs to be handled and uh or your uh your social security number has been uh has been hacked yeah, something like that. But it it's like it's gotten so widespread and so frequent now that 
I can't remember the last time I legitimately answered the phone for a number that wasn't in my contacts list already. So, yeah, I went through, uh, I actually have to say I went through a job hunt and so I was forced to actually answer calls, but so many of them were, were extended warranty calls. And, uh, were you yeah. ever worried that you were going to miss the call that you were actually waiting for? Cause you're on the line with <laughs> right. Shahid or whoever. It was easy enough to hang up, so it wasn't too bad. But. Yeah, you do have to wonder how much of how much of it is independent operations and how much of it is tied in with any some kind of major organized crime networks too. Yeah. yeah. And anymore, there's a there's a great deal of connection between organized crime and not only terrorist groups but also state intel agencies too well yeah because any sufficiently large organization can do this to as a dragnet and just because somebody's going to fall for it right yeah. well right i mean and i mean it's the same thing that we do when we're trying to market books you're yeah. going to get so many impressions you're going to get so many clicks and then those clicks are going to lead to so many commitments even if that percentage is low over time it's got value so. Yeah, which well, is why we have, instead, of, is a little more instead of telling them that I have a book for sale, <laughs> yes, we're a lot more honest than things. that, but it's the same concept. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of telling them I have a book for sale, though, I just say that, you know, there are sexy locals in their area that want to meet up. That's right. They're, but uh, first, uh, you got to buy this book. Yeah. The, the one I'm seeing is, uh, is, um, is Slavic women looking for older men. Isn't that all of them, though? <laughs> I know. Like yeah. I remember when I first got out of the Navy, when I first got off of active duty, I went back to China Lake and I went to the junior college there. And while I was there, I did a little bit of translation work for a retired Air Force pilot who uh, was getting himself a, a Russian mail or actually Ukrainian, as it were. Uh, mail order bride and, and <laughs> they're they're all the same. There's no I'm like if that was that was what tw you know 25 years ago and it's you know it's still the same. Yeah. Yeah. Well now they're uh now that's just an evac plan though. Before it was <laughs> right, you know, right, an right. immigration thing. Well, Except, did you see early the 90s it might have been an evac plan anyway. That's fair. Uh did, did you see there this couple that escaped Ukraine? Came in under the refugee program to Britain. I'm dropping again. Damn it. it well, so this couple uh, took refuge in Britain for the, the Ukrainian war. And they are voluntarily leaving Britain to go back to Ukraine because the rent's too high. This is a legit headline. So. Did you hear I mean, that, Alex? He get dropped or is he on a delay? Yeah, he's, he's getting, he's dropping. <clears throat> yeah. I thought maybe you just didn't find it that funny. I was like, all right, well, to each his own. No, I, don't, I don't think you heard it. Sorry. <clears throat> Let's see. Can we get him back? Oh. So yeah, there are actually Russians in uh, Black Arts number twelve too. And oh, in yeah. fact, uh, more Russian <laughs> profanity than I've worked into a book before uh, yet. Is uh, so. Here's the thing, though, with Black Arts, though you you have because of the tone and the the sort of mood of that series, you you can't just go. This is a Russian, you know, character. You have to go, this is a Russian character. This is like straight up every stereotype out of uh, every 80s movie, you know. I'm not saying that old To the boy, point where he's got to be wearing the striped shirt. like. No, no striped shirt. He does have a, a red suit coat on. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so at least uh, he's wrapping the party. Yeah, and his... Uh, his weapon of choice is an over-under uh, shotgun. As a Russian does, yeah. yeah. Welcome back, Alex. Yeah, I think I've got a uh, unstable connection, I think. 
my 15 year olds in the other room streaming some movie with her boyfriend. So I probably need to go break in there with a flashlight, make sure everything's okay. Yeah. We've come full circle to the dial up, uh, one line connections. Yeah. Like, mom, I'm on the phone. That's right. <clears throat> yeah. Got so much more bandwidth, but everything uses so much more bandwidth that it may yeah. as well be the same thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what is it? Uh, this, I think uh, I read it on a fortune cookie once. Mo money, mo problems, right? Yes, I, I do believe that, uh, that the uh, ancient philosopher uh, Biggie Smalls had something to say about that. Yeah. Uh, He's right up there with Confucius for me. So, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, fellas, I think that my internet connection is telling me that I should probably uh, peace out on this. Uh, I know you guys usually go for a bit longer, but uh, I think I'm going to keep dropping. I'm not quite sure what's going on. All right. Uh, before you head out, though, where can uh, people find your your books? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, they're uh, they're really available on Amazon right now. We have the um, audio book is in the works, but right now you can get the ebook, paperback, hardback. Frankly, the hardback's like what three bucks more than the than the paperback, so just you know run with that. But uh, yeah, yeah, currently available on Amazon, and when once we get that uh, that audio book done, we'll uh, we'll have that up on Audible. Um, and then of course you can, uh, if you, you know, search me up on, on Twitter, I've, you know, I, I try to stay active on Twitter. In fact, we actually have a little, uh, a little group. You guys might be interested. Um, it's called, it's a community called war porn. If you just, if you just, you know, search for war porn, uh, you'll find us. There's, uh, some military thriller writers. Basically I collected all of the cold war goes hot guys and then just started adding other people to it. Um, we're at like 33 people. Uh, it's pretty. It's a pretty cool mix of of writers, uh, including some nonfiction guys. You know, most of us are military vets. Not everybody. Um, so yeah, check out War Porn on Twitter. And uh, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. If, and if you're really desperate, you can go to uh, alexaronson.com and uh, actually it's alexanderaronson.com because I wasn't thinking when I registered the domain. Uh, and, and there, you know, there, I do a couple of other things. Uh, you know, there are some, some maps that go with some of the battles in both the Monroe Doctrine and in uh, Advanced to Contact. Uh, so, you know, there's a little bit of extra content there if you're interested in it. Um, and, you know, again, Facebook. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of all over the place. So if you just uh, search me up, I'm pretty easy to find. All right. Awesome. Good and deal. hey, guys, I, I can't thank you enough for for bringing me in here. Um, you know, I've had a lot of fun and and don't let my early exit uh, make you think anything otherwise. Um, but yeah, you guys have been absolutely great hosts and, and it's been uh, an absolute blast to do this. I hope we get to do it again soon. Oh, yeah. Good having you. Been great having you. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good one. Did he drop out again or is it? No, I think he actually meant to drop out. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Alex's books uh, book is out, and the next one is coming out, you say, next month? Uh, January. January. January, yeah. Yeah. So. I don't know. He said the, the other one was going to come out today, though, and then it came out two weeks earlier. So. Yeah. So. So, yeah, we'll see. Keep your ear to the ground, guys. Yep. As for your host, yes, Concrete Jungle is out today. Actually, a uh, an outgrowth of an idea that I had as a follow-on to American Praetorians. It was originally going to feature the broker. Oh. But... Uh, I remember you telling me about this, yeah. Yeah. Instead... Praetorians ended in 2017, so it uh, seemed like using doing it doing it anyway with uh, Erica Dalka instead was going to work. So, and of course, I couldn't just just leave it with the Russian mob, but I'll I'll leave it. Do you have you ever had just one bad guy in in your books? Uh, <clears throat> probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Which I get it because in our uh, experience, it's never just one bad guy. Yeah. 
I think, I think High Desert Vengeance had only the only the cartel. Okay, that doesn't count though, because the cartels are. Eh, nah, all right, I'll give you that one. Yeah. If, if you're in the Gulf, just cartels, have the Iranians. Though. What was that? And if you're in the Gulf, just have the Iranians. But it's never just the Iranians. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I like complicated because reality is complicated. Yeah, I was and, gonna say it's because that's what we know. And like it's, it's, it's never just Iranians. It's never just the, right. yeah. And uh, you know the uh, the edits for the Rock of Battle, which is the sixth and last book of the Lost, are into Wargate. So that's currently lined up for December 29th. Oh, nice. It might come out later or earlier, rather. We'll have to see. Um, audio for Swords Against the Night came out uh, a couple weeks ago. And I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that uh, the Alchemy of Treason should be under produ in production for audio here now or very soon dude you you've got to get like i mean, i know it's way out of the the expenses or the the budget but you got to get like a licensed soundtrack to release with these and it's all just going to be like ingve malmstein and <laughs> and scorpion just straight up fantasy power metal yeah yeah like rhapsody blind guardian <laughs> No, maybe some sabaton, maybe, maybe a little bit. You know. Yeah, they don't do the fantasy stuff too much, but they no, 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 sabaton. Wait, no, sabaton might not actually work because, like, whenever they do, uh, like a song just on a specific unit or a branch or something like that, it is so absurdly moto that, like, it's it's hard to even listen to because you're just like, oh, it's cringe, yeah. When they do it like an event or a person, it's awesome, but yeah. But, but it's only Bog those of us who've been in who get who find the moto so much cringe. It's oh like yeah. All, all the normies don't don't necessarily understand it. No, I, I'm I'm sure the normie civilian Sabaton fan finds 82nd all the way to be like one of the greatest songs they've ever produced. Those Which of us it, it's up there. Come, it's up there. Those but of man. us who did jump school are just going. <laughs> yeah. We call no, it there, Marine Corps. There's probably a lot of 82nd guys who are just like, yeah, finally, a song about us. And everybody who knows an 82nd guy is like, oh, God. <laughs> we, we call jump school Marine Corps Appreciation School for a reason. <laughs> hey, I've got as many combat drums as they do. <sighs> My uh, company commander came back from it and He's just he was just so visibly relieved to be back. He just I missed you guys. You're smart. You do what you're told. <laughs> Don't let that go to your head, but you know. <laughs> yeah. That that would have been the next words out of out of Captain Nichols mouth. It's like not not compared to most people, but compared to those guys. <laughs> when he was leaving cuz our our company call sign that uh, that deployment was Grey Goose because it was the first sergeant's uh, favorite podcast. Uh, of course. On account of the company commander's prematurely gray hair, he became known as Grey Hair Goose. And when it, his fail hail farewell, he was pointing to his scalp saying, this is your fault. <laughs> you did this. You guys did this to me. You made me age like a president. <laughs> well, one of the best company commanders I ever had. Yeah, of course. No, so once that like you, that other problem. <laughs> it's just... Yeah. Because they're just like, hmm, you never got it, did you? Well, folks, I think we've pretty much covered what we're gonna what we've got to cover for uh, tonight. Uh, it was mostly that... memes, but we'll we'll allow it. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully going to have uh, James Rasone on next month. And uh, until then, 
we will see you all next time.